Okay, well, welcome again to everyone and thanks for joining uh, us today for today's webinar about preparing for 2022 PAMA data reporting. <clears throat> My name is Alex Mitchell and I'm the communications manager for Lighthouse Lab Services and I'll be serving as your host and MC for today's event. I just have a couple housekeeping items I want to go over before we introduce today's speakers. Uh, first, uh, you can reduce your chance of buffering or dropping altogether by closing any bandwidth heavy apps you may have running in the background. Uh, to answer the, your question, this webinar will be recorded and we will be sending it to everyone who registered afterward. So no need to uh, follow up with us on that. Uh, if you have any questions throughout today's event, there will be a Q&A section at the end, but you can also put those right into the Q&A chat box at any time uh, throughout the presentation. Our speakers will see those, and as they are able to, they will reply, and those will become visible to the entire audience. And we'll also be running polls during the webinar, and we highly encourage you to participate in those. Uh, it helps keep us engaged, and we will have a few uh, handout offers as well that you can keep your eyes open for. So our speakers uh, to cover the PAMA data reporting today are Ann Lambrix, our Vice President of RCM Consulting, and Josh Yellen, our Vice President of RCM Strategy and Growth. Uh, they're both highly knowledgeable about this subject, and since it's been uh, since 2017, since labs has last had to report, um, I believe we could all use a refresher. And with that, I'll turn it over to Josh. Thanks, Alex. Appreciate the introduction and your emceeing of the event. Want to welcome everybody to this webinar and thank you for joining. Hope you can take some tidbits home to help with your respective PAMA reporting. Brief refresher on PAMA. So the history of PAMA was uh, it was created to align Medicare's clinical lab fee schedule and payments to market rates over a phased in period. It was primarily a market driven reaction stemming from years of insurers cutting the clinical lab fee schedule. These are rates of 40% of Medicare allowable or 50% of Medicare allowable as you labs typically or pathologists saw in your uh, managed care contracts. And the data was evidence-based. In fact, a 2013 governmental OIG report found that Medicare paid between 18 and 30% higher than other insurers for 20 of the highest volume or highest expenditure laboratory tests. <clears throat> so what do the payment reductions look like? In 2018 and 19 and 20, lab tests were capped at 10% reductions per year. So regardless of the findings of the original 2017 reporting data, for example, if a, if a lab test was reported as being paid 50% over market, the government capped the annual reductions to 10% per year. In 2021, we got a breather or a reprieve sort of uh, through the CARES Act. But while we were dealing with the CARES Act or while we got the repriever, uh, we were also dealing with an influx of COVID and other laboratory issues. So it was not really a breather year for any of us. And yet the PAMA reductions will continue in the following year, 2022, but the new fee schedule reduction kicks in and that is now capped at 15% per year from 2022 until 2024. There's been a lot of commentary on the actual impact of the PAMA uh, fee schedule cuts, but 2018 data showed that the reduction in Medicare expenditures for laboratory was significantly higher than planned as a result of PAMA. So there was a projected cut of 390 million and the data actually showed reductions of $670 million in payments. This slide is gonna give you an example of the power of compounding. So if we take one test, the 84153 assay of PSA, and we follow it over the life of the PAMA reductions. In 2017, 
Uh, we saw it, it, it was it was priced at 25, 23, a 10% reduction took it down two and a half dollars, then four and a half dollars cumulatively, then six point eight dollars. We had the 2021 reprieve. It goes down by nine dollars and sixty cents cumulatively in 2022, ending in 2024 at 13.94 percent. So uh, while compounding generally works for us, in this way it works against us. But thankfully, if there's one upside, downward compounding works in our favor because it's not as aggressive as upward compounding. But yet, you can see that from 2017 to 2024. The 84153 took a 55% or will have taken a 55% pricing haircut for clinical laboratories. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Anne, who's going to talk about fee schedule cuts and other PAMA items in more detail. Anne? Sure. Thanks, Josh. Uh, I think you're all seeing now a survey um, or a poll. I'm sorry, I used the wrong term, but a poll. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and answer that question or, or do it later, as I'm going to do. Um, the fee schedule cuts, and this is this uh, this slide um, is just an example um, for, for our tox labs, um, how we see um, that weighted median, again, is, is from the the information, the reporting from the, the last um, um, PMA report um, that was submitted. And so we would expect that this is where um, Medicare is, is intending to go. Um, so you can see that that weighted median for the, for example, the GO480, um, the, the fee schedule looks to be um, on, on course to be reduced 59% um, when this is all said and done. And so again, we would, we would argue as, as um, uh, we can continue to see um, reimbursement cuts um, with not only Medicare, but we, we will see this, we see this with the managed care plans um, that when this is reported in 2022, um, that weighted median potentially could be even lower. Josh, did, you know, what, what is your, your thought on that? Anything to add there? No, I, I the yes, there is something to add there. Okay, uh, good. <laughs> generally speaking, what we're seeing is that uh, when you look at all of these codes, the the zero four eight zero, the eight one eight two eight three, the fee schedules in seventeen, uh, one seventeen sixty five, one sixty two zero four two fifty five, and what industry and market was reporting were that payments were significantly lower, generally speaking, as compared to Medicare. So you went on the 0480, you went from 117 Medicare fee schedule to a weighted median across the country payment of 4796, giving you a difference of almost $70 per test. Mm -hmm. And so the purpose of PAMA is, is to rectify this gross, uh, what they're considering to be an overpayment um, uh, for, for this test rather than really looking at what the market should be pricing the test at, which we would argue is uh, above the weighted median. Right. We, you know, I, I would always say, you know, Medicare wants to be the lowest payer outside of Medicaid. And so again, you can see Medicare is paying much higher than what a lot of these managed plans. And, and this is the data that, that supports the continued reduction in, in this reimbursement. Uh, so getting into the fun part of, of applicable labs and, you know, again, I'm going to go back to um, the reason for this webinar today is, you know, when, when looking at the clients that we're working with, um, you know, I worked with several um, for the initial reporting period. And I found that, again, it's typically a scramble um, to, to get the, the information to de determine if I'm applicable. Um, to pull the information from my third-party biller if that, that is something that you're utilizing. Um, and so I felt that it was, was Im uh, important because um, in all honesty with COVID and, and, and seeing the um, rates um, you know, uh, not decrease last year, um, they were on a freeze. Um, and, and with all of the, the, the issues or the, the challenges that surrounded COVID testing, um, I th in, in, in all honesty, this 
slipped my mind as far as PAMA. It has not gone away. And I think that there were many that was hopeful that um, there would be some success in, in eliminating this or changing the applicable labs um, for reporting, et cetera. Um, at this point, that has not um, been successful. Um, and so we do have to address this. And so again, thought that this time period of, of um, you know, August of, of 2021, good time to start thinking about this and talking about it. So getting into PAMA here and now, um, this is what we have to deal with. Uh, it's not gone away. Um, you need to determine if you're an applicable lab. Um, so again, making sure that you're meeting these uh, thresholds, um, billing Medicare Part B under your own MPI, um, that you're meeting the majority of Medicare revenues. So again, 50%, so um, greater than 50% of your Medicare revenues from one or more of a combination of the clinical lab fee schedule or the physician fee schedule. So you have to add up both. So Medicare, so I put that formula in there, Medicare um, clinical lab fee schedule plus the Medicare physician fee schedule. Um, if it's greater than that, you would meet that, that, that bullet, that, that particular um, uh, piece of the applicability. Um, the next uh, indicator is if you're meeting or exceeding that low exp expenditure threshold, which means that you have to exceed, you have to meet 12,500 of your Medicare revenues must be coming from your clinical lab fee schedule during the data collection period, which is, um, uh, we'll talk about further, but it is, uh, Alex, correct me if I'm wrong, because I know it's on our additional slide, but is it uh, January through June of 2019? That's correct. Yep. Okay. All That's right. One good. of the things that makes it a little goofy here since <laughs> right. there's been so many delays, but you're right. right on that. Okay. Um, so one of the things I, I do want for our um, pathology groups that are on the, the call, um, some things that we learned from our, our last reporting period um, is that if you're billing the professional component of clinical pathology, Keep in mind that that's not paid off of the clinical lab fee schedule. Medicare doesn't reimburse you for the professional component of clinical pathology on their fee schedule. It's paid to you in that Part A um, OPPS bundle payment to the hospital, and you negotiate with your hospital for that revenue. So that would not be included in your calculation. Um, and um, the other thing is, is for hospital outreach labs, um, one of the the categories that I wanted to, to talk about or make sure that, that everyone was aware of is, is the, the hospital outreach labs must utilize the CMS 1450, which is really the UB92. It's, it's the, the hospital bill, the claim. Most of our groups that we work with um, in labs, the independent labs, you're billing on a, a HICFA 1500. So again, if, if you're, you're, you're going through these, these different um, um, uh, bullets and, and you're trying to determine if you're applicable, um, those are two things that I wanted to kind of point out um, to the, the, the groups that we have on, on the call today. Okay, here is our data collection period. Um, and again, we'll kind of skip through uh, really right now. Oh, I'm so sorry. Again, we have a poll. Um, so please uh, complete that if you could. This gives some um, timeline or, or uh, historical data, but, but really right now we need to worry about this January 1st, 2019 through June 30th, 2019. That is the data collection period that we are concerned about. Um, and so as Alec me Alex mentioned, um, keep in mind that's, I mean, really two years ago. And so a lot may have changed in two years. And so my recommendation is, again, uh, looking at who was doing your billing at the time. Um, all billing, um, if they've been in business since 2019, uh, really 2017, um, they should be familiar with PAMA and be able to understand what is needed to pull the data. Um, and there's some good there's some good templates uh, for that are provided on additional slides that we can help provide as well. But the data collection period is is the the time of where we're going to pull the data, and then you will be required to submit that data to um, Medicare PAMA um, January 1st through March 30th, 2022. So your deadline is March 30th this next year. So for data collection again. Um, with, with labs that we worked with uh, way back when um, for the first reporting period, um, it was kind of just making sure that they were pulling the correct information from, 
from their system in order to report, you will be required to pull the, the really the CPT code or HCPCS code associated with the test. And then what Medicare is really looking for is your private payer rate. They don't care what Medicare is paying. Again, is to establish their rates. Medicare wants to be the lowest payer. They want to find out what you're getting from private payer from, from your managed care plans. Um, and so during that data collection period, January through June, they want to know what final payment was made. Um, and they want to know the um, associated volume of tests performed corresponding to each payer rate. So what was interesting is, is for some payers, you may be getting paid different rates for the same code. You have to be able to report the different rates. Every single rate that you're getting, that final payment rate, must be reported. It's not an average. Um, they want to know each rate that you're getting. I think the, the information on the examples, um, there is a document that um, Medicare provides that gives you a, a summary of, of all the information. They do provide some examples um, uh, of the how the, the data collection, um, what they want. All right, how do you report? Um, this is important. You need to confirm your enrollment data and PECOS is correct. Again, it's been two years. Um, hopefully you're maintaining PECOS and that information is validated and, and appropriate, um, but you need to make sure PECOS is correct. Um, and then there is a portal, this Enterprise Identity Management System, EIDM. Um, as I recall, this is something similar to if you, um, if any of your, if I have any of my professional groups um, reporting MIPS in the past, when we would report, we would use uh, a, a portal. And this um, EIDM is, is something similar. There's a portal, you're going to need a username and password. And um, again, I've done this in the past. So if you're going to need help in navigating and how to, how to get to um, where uh, you go to submit this data, let us know. We can we can certainly uh, uh, assist you there. And for le let me just comment only from uh, from experience that if if your lab is part of a health system that is required to report, uh, there's typically one user ID and password for one individual per EIN. And so if that individual is not in your department. There's a certain amount mm -hmm. of time when you have two-factor authentication and you have to use the code within 20 minutes or 15 minutes. So just coordinate with, uh, with your health system leadership as part of the submission process to ensure you don't get locked out. That's a really good point, Josh. And again, um, why we wanted to bring this in and continue with this conversation now in August, um, because that finding who has that access may be a challenge. So again, um, because we're looking at two years uh, uh, going past and then we're gonna report this this coming year, um, it, it, it it's, it's important to start thinking about this now and then again, who's got access and who needs to be given access and if it needs to be reset. Again, this provides a nice link. Alex, this will be provided out to our, our attendees, correct? After the, after the webinar? That's correct. Everyone okay. will receive a recording and uh, all the links will be available uh, for viewing in there. Great. Oh, timeline for more cuts. And again, Josh's slide uh, at the beginning kind of talked about this, but we, once you submit that data, um, that data collection, we, we would expect, again, reimbursement's gone down since the last reporting. Uh, we would expect that, um, you know, they'll, they'll get new data. There is a reduction cap um, for 15%. And then Alex, I'm gonna call on you and I apologize, but can you, as far as for, through 2025, um, is, is, uh, are we waiting for once that data collection has been, um, reviewed, we would expect them, them to reestablish their timeline of additional cuts past 2025? That's correct. Um, yep. right now it kind of remains to be seen where we'll be going, uh, forward. Mm -hmm. Right now, the Protecting Access to Medicare Act, the text itself only has the statutory reductions, um, capped it. 15% over each of the next uh, three years following this reporting round. Thank so you. Yep, that, that does remain to be seen. And um, 
I, I will just answer real quick. Uh, the recording for today's session will be uh, emailed out to everyone after uh, this event. Thanks again, Alex. All right, so penalties. So again, um, you know, it, it, it's imperative for us to say uh, there is, um, per the PAMA, the, the, the regulation does allow for a penalty for non-reporting up to 10,000 per day per violation. So that could be pretty steep. Um, at this point, our understanding, no labs were penalized for 2018 reporting. Um, however, if this is a, uh, a program they want to continue with, it is, uh, again, um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if we would see uh, that in the future, um, these penalties actually, you know, be enforced. Um, so it is, you know, I would recommend um, at least attempting to um, do your due diligence and make your best attempt to submit. Um, and um, that way, uh, you know, you're, you're not um, uh, a guinea pig, uh, so to speak. You're not, you're not called out um, from Medicare for, for non-compliance. We did want to kind of talk about NILA and the advocacy um, that they've they've shown um, as far as again trying to get this overhauled. Um, and unfortunately, again at this time, um, that hasn't been successful. However, um, you know, really to just speak to, they're contending um, this initial survey, so the initial review. Um, it leaned too heavily on the data submitted by the, the large independents such as Quest and LabCorp. So again, um, we, we saw the economies of scale with Quest and LabCorp within the last you know, several years where they were successful in, in you know, potentially um, accepting lower reimbursement. Um, some of our smaller labs, you know, unfortunately, have not been as successful in, 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 in getting that um, you know, being able to negotiate higher rates. And so we've seen that that drive down and then the, the contracts and the, and the reimbursement from our, our commercial payers. Um, so again, the argument has been uh, for um, more uh, applicable labs to be able to report. So there was a, a more comparable data. Um, if, if, you know, in, in re reviewing managed care contracts, you know, with our pathology groups, we're hospital-based, um, we're successful in getting better better contracts versus independent labs, again, are, are compared to what Quest and LabCorp are getting and, and, and um, successful in, in um, accepting. Um, so again, Nyla continues to push back on, on um, the, the latest MedPAC report, um, noting that 0.7% um, of laboratories paid under Medicare Part B on the clinical lab fee schedule reported applicable data to CMS. So again, we're, we're, not, we're not looking at the, the, the true um, uh, the, the true data set um, that should be included to come up with with reasonable reimbursement um, for for the the clinical lab fee schedule, and, and that's been the argument. And so, um, you know, our hope is that there is continued voice, and I know Nyla is is continuing to fight on this um, continued voice for for our laboratories and 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 pathology groups that are are continuing to have to submit this data and be subject to the um, reductions based on the data that's provided. All right, Josh, back to you. Great. <clears throat> Thanks, Ann. Um, oh, we have another survey. Okay. So I, I want to talk about consumer price index for a moment and how it relates to laboratories. Uh, in the lab industry, we're in very precarious times. Um, networks are continuing to, to narrow or completely exclude laboratories from participating. Uh, our employees continue to want more money in their salary as they should for being good workers. And our costs continue to rise. And when you look at something like the consumer price index, you can see up here that overall, this is a July consumer price index. Overall consumer price index is now at 5.4%, typically higher than, than what I'm used to seeing in around the three to three and a half percent. 
but that's because we're in inflationary times, as most of you know from reading in the newspaper. And then specifically in medical care services down here, you see it's up eight tenths of a percent, which is lower than the 5.4, but relatively speaking, because the cost of health care, um, if, if it were at 5.4, it would be at dangerously high levels. So, so prices continue to rise, employees want more money, and we as labs and pathologists are sometimes being excluded from networks from being paid. So what, what does that mean for us? How do we cope with PAMA? How do we cope with all these challenges and headwinds that we're facing? And I wanna start that off with a story that I love to tell about the melon farmer. And the story goes that a melon farmer, he goes to his banker because he wants to expand his farm. And his banker looks at his financial statements and he says, you know, sir, you're losing 10 cents on every melon that you produce. How are you gonna get out of this? And the melon farmer looks at the banker and he says, I'm just gonna grow more melons. So the, the point of the story is that when you have a business plan that faces headwinds and challenges, and sometimes you can't make ends meet, you can't continue to go back to the same playbook. And if there was ever a time, it's now, that we should be, we as laboratorians and as lab operators and pathologists should be analyzing our operations, scrutinizing them under a magnifying glass and changing with the times. Um, there's so many different things that, that we could be doing and we'd like to provide you with some of those ideas. Um, uh, Andy, you wanna start and give some ideas around RevCycle? Sure. Uh, thanks, Josh. Uh, some of the, the things that we work on with our clients is just, again, reviewing their, their managed care contracts, um, understanding that reimbursement and exploring, again, what the strategy is behind, you know, expanding um, testing or, um, you know, if there is room for negotiation, working with um, our clients, again, as far as, you know, what's next? How do we, um, instead of just making more melons, um, how do we uh, effectively, um, strategically um, move forward? We also work with um, their billing operation, again, on the revenue cycle side um, in making sure that um, that is healthy. So our charges being captured, um, are your uh, 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 denials being appealed and followed up on timely? Um, is there good reporting to be able for, for you as a, a lab owner, as a pathology group, um, uh, as, as, a, as a practitioner, um, able to successfully um, manage your business and your revenue cycle and understand again where there's opportunities to enhance that. Um, so that's what we do and, and work with our clients on, on ensuring that um, we're, we're not leaving any stones unturned. Exactly, and that's great. I mean, one of the things that, that we like to talk about is uh, when we audit clients, we always open it up as we know that your revenue cycle is probably working well, but allow us to come in and audit the rev cycle as a pressure test to ensure that all the, the, the stones are turned and that you really do understand uh, down to the granular level how well your revenue cycle is performing against your own benchmarks, but then also against benchmarks that we see across the industry. Um, so some other ways to, to cope with PAMA cuts and, and general challenges in the industry is continue to build your business. Yes, easier said than done, but always important when you're in the face of cuts and reimbursement. Look at, as Ann said, incorporating new test menu offerings. Incorporate new strategies to make your lab or group unique and continue to carve out that niche for yourself. Um, we like to refer to companies with new technologies that could help laboratories enhance revenue cycle. Uh, some companies we refer to have technologies that help with pre-authorizations or demographic and insurance verification. Um, Lighthouse is rolling out its own tools in the near future to help laboratories with some of these uh, challenges. Consider your in-network managed care contracting strategies and mention that super important. Um, ask your biller about their ability to get you in network or Lighthouse's new Burns Consulting Group is a insurance contracting agency per se that can help you with your contracting needs. 
this is one of my personal favorites, but pass some of your lost revenue back to your vendors. So vendors love to come to laboratories and pathologists with the warm partnership. And if you're truly my partner, then join me in the pain. So if I'm losing, you too shall lose. And finally, scrutinize your expenses. Um, Lighthouse has a consulting arm that will come in and help you assess your supply and reagent costs to ensure that you're paying market rates. So there are ways to combat this and now is the time to do it. And so I, if I were the lab owner, I would utilize some of these strategies to look at ways to offset reductions in reimbursement from PAMA because they are here, they are going to happen in the near future. And we as laboratorians just have to find a way around them to survive. Alex, that's it for my slides. All righty. Well, thank you, Josh. I think we have just a few questions that uh, I believe we could tackle here during the Q&A session. Um, I'm not sure if either of you have had a chance to look at those, but um, one that has not been transferred over yet. Um, someone was asking if uh, COVID testing is on the CLFS, and I believe that's uh, on the physician fee schedule, but can you correct me if I'm wrong? I'm so sorry, uh, Alex, can you re, I'm, I'm looking for that question and I don't see that. It's so. in the chat. Um, okay. just, is Thank COVID you. on the okay, CLFS? That okay. was, oh, yep. Yes, COVID is on the CLFS. It's okay, on the CLFS. Yep. Yep. Okay, I was wrong there then. Um, and then the other questions there, uh, do you have to meet all three criteria to be an applicable lab? Um, so that would be billing under your own MPI, uh, great, more than 50% of your Medicare revenues coming from the CLFS and the physician fee schedule and receiving more than $12,500 in uh, CLFS payments between January and June of 2019? And the answer is yes, you yes. do need to meet all three of those criteria to be required to report. Uh, and then the question about a uh, strong lobbying or advocacy group for uh, lab services to help prevent these cuts. Uh, I think we spoke a little bit about NILA, the National Independent Laboratory Association. Um, Ann or Josh, anything more you could say there about some of the work they're doing alongside, of course, you know, CAP, um, the ACLA and others? Um, I Really, uh, I know that NILA has been all over this. And again, um, their recent um, uh, report or letter indicating, you know, they, they've been working and encouraging MedPAC um, uh, to recommend private payer rate data be collected from representative sample across the entire laboratory market. Um, you know, I, I think NILA is a, a really good resource and an advocacy group to participate with if you are an independent lab. Um, if you are not uh, participating with them, um, I don't know, Alex, if we can just provide their, their contact information in the chat, um, but I would certainly recommend that. They are, they're very strong when it comes to um, this PMO reporting. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, just I, I don't have uh, Nyla's information available offhand, but you know, certainly search Nyla National Independent Lab Association if you'd like to reach out to them. As Ann said, they've been on top of this issue since day one and a lot of great resources um, to assist with your PAMA reporting on their website as well. So can't thank them enough for the work they've done uh, on this subject. I'm putting the, their website. Um... Thank you. Right on, on the chat. Yep. Perfect. For everybody. Yep. Perfect. And um, I think we had one other question about um, the from Matthew Sullivan. Do you see that in the Q and A? And I think I think yes. that would have to go back to um, we, you would need more information to determine whether or not you would have to report. Right. Yep. There's 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 some different numbers that we're going to have to look at to verify, not just the NPI. Um, we need to look at your your dollars, really, of, of what you're um, getting paid from Medicare. Yep. It looks like we just got one more. Um, please define, you know, private payer um, in, in regards for what they're looking for here. And would they have to be billed on that 14x uh, that TOB? So I'll take that. So private payer would be um, the commercial insurers. Um, it does ex this does exclude the Medicare Advantage products. Um, so it's just your your commercial payers. Yep. Um, and and that fourteen X would only come into play if they were a hospital, hospital outreach, outreach lab. lab. Yep, correct. Yep. 
Uh, yes, uh, in terms of the reporting templates, those are available on CMS's uh, website for PAMA. Um, if you just Google PAMA CMS, it's the first result that comes up. Nyla has those available as well. And then links to those um, are on the slides um, for the, uh, the reporting template slides. Um, so feel free when you get the recording to look back at those and you'll be able to find that template. Okay, but if that is um, all we have for questions today, I want to thank everyone for attending and also invite you to join us for our webinar next month, where we'll be uh, discussing lab director duties. Uh, is your lab director doing their job? What you should look for when you're hiring a lab director and more. Uh, if you're interested in, in pre-registering for that event, we just had a little pop-out slide where you could follow that link to do so. And if not, you know, check back for our social media websites. Um, we'll be advertising uh, that event all month. We're going to have a couple great speakers from our lab director services team. So uh, we're really excited about that one. But thank you again to Ann and Josh. Uh, great information today, both very knowledgeable, and we appreciate your time. And thank you to everyone who had uh, joined. Thank you.